The 23rd of June, 2023. The Russo-Ukrainian war rages on. Soldiers on both sides continue to do battle by land, sea and air, with many paying the ultimate price. And yet, in an unexpected turn of events, private military company the Wagner Group withdraws its troops from the conflict and heads towards the Russian border. Mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin orders his men to seize Russia's southern city of Rostov-on-Don, the opening salvo of a mutiny against the Kremlin. Prigozhin's move sparks rumors of an armed rebellion across Russia. And in no time at all, the Wagner Group march on Moscow to face the most powerful man in Europe. What happens next could change the course of the world forever. A Russian private army leader called for an armed rebellion against the Kremlin. There's been a dramatic escalation in tensions between Russia's military and the Wagner mercenary group, raising fears it could lead to a civil war in Russia. Putin understands power very, very well. I would say he understands power better than almost any other world leader, and he has done for a long time. The ultimate goal of a dictator is to gain power, and then once you've got power, the goal of the dictator becomes to keep that power. Problem is with dictatorships, there's no way in which the country can change direction without either a palace coup or an assassination or, of course, the dictator dying. It's like a turf war among mafia bosses. Of course, one of the key issues in any kind of mafia situation is to keep the peace. You don't want anybody to rock the boat. And that was Prigozhin's mistake now. He rocked the boat. Russia's political system of the last 100 years has always been focused on power. Power over people, power over land, power over Western enemies. For the majority of the 20th century, the Soviet Union stood as one of the two major global forces. The USSR's empire covered 11 of the world's time zones and extended more than 6,800 miles from east to west during the Cold War years. By the late 1980s, Russian autocracy became increasingly unpopular with citizens all over the Soviet Union. Mikhail Gorbachev's time as leader ushered in two major policies, perestroika and glasnost. Perestroika allowed the Soviet people to vote in democratic elections and also encouraged more economic freedom. In turn, glasnost was taken to mean increased openness from the Soviet government. Они стремились запечатлеть свидетельство людей, 
непосредственно причастных к трагедии, уроки которой. The handling of the 1986 Chernobyl disaster completely undermined Gorbachev's drive for transparency. The Soviet government tried to hide the nuclear disaster from the people and downplay the health effects from radiation. I think that they have provided as full and prompt information as they should have. Our own pictures give us information that suggests the casualty rates are higher than those that have been announced by the Soviet Union so far by a good measure. The disaster exposed the government's deep levels of corruption. Citizens in Soviet states could no longer ignore the callousness of their leaders. As a matter of fact, we know next to nothing about what has happened. I have been advised to uh, wash uh, ourselves and our children, uh, hair to change clothes. We пришли на этот митинг, чтобы сказать свое решительное нет реакционному курсу Горбачева и его команде. In the years which followed, growing anti-communist sentiment unleashed a mass protest movement against the authorities. Political revolution in Poland sparked other Eastern European states to rise up against their oppressors. In 1989, the people's anger reached East Germany, and Europe's most famous symbol of division finally collapsed. East German troops took control of the key section of the Berlin Wall at the Brandenburg Gate early this morning. They stopped the party, but any hopes they had of stopping the West Berliners destroying the wall were soon dashed, as dozens of young men pulled on a rope and chains, the chant went up, Mauer weg, down with the wall. The reply was swift. This is the wall the East Germans themselves built and they don't like to see it broken down from the West. Water cannon were drawn up, but the West Berliners were determined. I think the people here in Western Germany live with the wall since 1961, and I think that now it's time to, to break the wall down, you know. The wall was crumbling, the sledgehammers in the hands of men not born when it went up. From the wall and from behind it, the East Germans tried to stop the tide, one West Berliner sprayed champagne back. Another urged the border guards, come over, come over. Then, just before 10 o'clock, the moment Berliners have waited 28 years for. Even the East Germans seemed exhilarated, a symbolic breach in the structure that separated millions and claimed hundreds of lives. West German riot police stopped the crowd surging onto communist soil, but by then they'd made their point. The East Germans closed the wall, but the whole section at the Brandenburg Gate had cracked and the momentum had begun. At the fall of the Berlin Wall, Putin felt he was watching one of the largest and most powerful empires the world has ever seen unravel in the most pathetic and humiliating way. The Soviet Union as a whole dissolved by 1991, and Russia quickly found itself losing relevance. Russia has, has got this, this thing about being a great power. This dates back to, you know, to the end of the Cold War, and it's quite hard, I think, for lots of people in the West to understand how humiliating that loss for, for Russia was. And ever since then, I think he has, you know, he has feared the, the people who beat him, and he has wanted to, to, to get back some sense of, of Russian pride.
Putin soon began to harbor his frustration to pursue a career in politics. Over the next decade, he rose from a mid-ranking cog on the periphery of the KGB to become the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. After the collapse of communism in uh, the Soviet Union in 1991, he gets a job with the new democratically elected mayor in St. Petersburg. And really, um, the, the, the speculation is that the reason that Sobchak gives him a job is that he wants somebody who has KGB connections as his kind of tough guy, as his guy who can actually be the link person with the security services and the link person with organized crime. It basically becomes his bag carrier, but what he's doing is he's forging connections by people, you know, in industry, in politics, you know, all, all around St. Petersburg. Putin is the indispensable grey man. You know, he's, he's not you know, making speeches, he's not being a politician, he's simply being a functionary, he's being a bureaucrat. But what Putin knows, and what people often know, is that the people at the nexus of power, it's people in the marge, it's people, you know, in, at the meeting points of power, are the people who actually gain the power, because they're the people who knows you know, what different people want, and they can manage those relationships. And suddenly, Putin finds himself you know, at the heart of, heart of power in St. Petersburg. He finds himself enriching himself because everything is corrupt. So that is a key part of the Putin narrative, that relationship with subject. In 1996, Putin's call to Moscow finally came. President Boris Yeltsin made Putin his deputy chief of presidential staff, and then, two years later, the director of the FSB, the successor security organization to the KGB. Russia in the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin was certainly a very chaotic environment. Yeltsin and his government have been trying to create a market economy. Rather than creating a market economy, what they've done is that they've transferred ownership in the most important bits of the Russian economy to a small number of individuals who've become mega rich. In Russia at that time, there was no rule of law. If you had a disagreement with someone, you sorted it out with violence. Because there was no, you know, you couldn't have a business dispute and take it to the court. There were no, there were no courts. There was a ton of money floating around, and the money was getting bigger, you know, especially because with the economic reforms, the exchange rates on the uh, international market, the disparity was so huge. The, you know, you could, you could buy a barrel of oil for next to nothing in rubles and sell it for a fortune in dollars. They called it the Wild East. The memories of that time really die hard for lots of Russians. And actually, for a lot of Russians, given them the choice between authoritarianism and, and the anarchy of the Yeltsin years, they'll take authoritarianism. They'll say, you know, we don't really, we don't want that anymore. You know, freedom, freedom is a pretty nebulous concept when, when there's anarchy around. Putin's loyalty and strength during this period captured Yeltsin's eye. The president appointed Putin prime minister of the Russian Federation in August 1999, and later announced that he wanted to see him as his successor. This, this is really important because Yeltsin is looking for the right successor. Yeltsin is very anxious about leaving office because if he leaves office, he's very worried that, that people will want to get revenge for various things that happened. What Yeltsin wants is a peaceful retirement. And in order to get a peaceful retirement, he needs to hand over power to somebody who he trusts. As of now, Putin's rating is zero. Uh, he was never regarded as a serious presidential contender, and I don't think that Yeltsin's approval would add much uh, to that zero. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Putin had seen close up how weak the new Russia had become. It soon became clear that his presidential style 
was going to be very different to that of his predecessor. On taking over the reins, he constructed himself as a no-nonsense tough guy and the true hero of modern Russia. Misinformation, corruption and the elimination of opponents became the basis of Putin's power. He wants to absolutely control the agenda. It's said that his predecessor, President Boris Yeltsin, the only thing that he had on his desk was a pen, which he used to sign presidential decrees. And when Putin takes over from Yeltsin, the pen gets replaced by a remote control because he's so obsessed with uh, his image on television. And, uh, and various people who met him early in his uh, presidency say sometimes he, he used to uh, stop the meetings to turn on the news to see how he's being reported. You hold on to power as a dictator by getting increasingly ruthless. You also hold on to power by making sure uh, that you control the message. You've got to keep lying. Lie, 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 lie. So you've got to keep your people in the dark. And that's how you keep power. If we go back to the Soviet Union, really propaganda is the attempt to persuade people that reality is something other than it is. Soviet propaganda was, was constantly saying how life is much better in the Soviet Union, how people are starving in the outside world, the West is corrupt, and there's no truth to it, but say it enough and force people to repeat it. But Putin era propaganda is very different. It's no longer trying to convince people of an ideology. It's no longer trying to convince people that communism is the best kind of system. Actually, Putinist propaganda isn't trying to convince people of anything. It's just trying to confuse. What Putin wants is for people not to know what's real. Vladimir Putin's intentions to restore Russia's greatness have not faltered. His thirst for control goes hand in hand with his desire for Russian influence to spread far and wide. The president remains intent on not letting history repeat itself. President Putin is notorious for keeping a tight circle. He values loyalty above all else. And in the early 2000s, he placed his faith in the entrepreneur and former criminal, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Between the late 70s until the early 90s, gang member Prigozhin spent nine years in prison for robbery, theft and fraud. Authorities even sent him to a high-security penal colony, isolated from the general population. The Supreme Court of the Soviet Union released him early for corrective behavior. But years later, he would use his thuggish past to convince prisoners to join the Wagner Group. On his release, Prigozhin followed the entrepreneurial spirit of the 1990s and opened grocery, restaurant and gambling businesses. He gained the status of oligarch over the next decade and quickly reached high places, often seeking the ears of the influential politicians and the wealthy. In the early 2000s, he personally served food to Vladimir Putin, French President Jacques Chirac and even George W. Bush. With these events, Prigozhin grew closer and closer to the Russian leader. He became known as Putin's chef. Prigozhin used profits from his catering business to found the Internet Research Agency, a Russian company which engaged in online propaganda and influence operations, including the setup of troll accounts across major social media platforms. 
The West even accused the agency of interfering in the 2016 US elections. I've never said I'm a perfect person, nor pretended to be someone that I'm not. We will double our growth and have the strongest economy anywhere in the world. At the same time, we will get along with all other nations willing to get along with us. His illegal business and political practices made Yevgeny Prigozhin one of the most corrupt people in the world. Our three countries stand shoulder to shoulder against Russia's barbaric invasion. We're standing up for democracy against authoritarianism and standing with Ukraine. It's war and violence once again cast a dark shadow over Europe. We are working together. Vladimir Putin's obsession with holding back NATO and expanding Russian influence has led to one of the deadliest conflicts since World War II. The outbreak of the Ukraine war in February 2022 is the most defining moment of Putin's presidency so far. His problem with, with NATO is that he thinks that NATO is an aggressive power, whereas NATO regards itself as a defensive power. And so, you know, this is why he has this sort of fundamental issue with former Soviet republics turning to NATO, turning to the West, because he sees it as, as the world against him. I think another really important hallmark of any dictator is that they become increasingly paranoid. They think the world's against them. And then they act in that way. And then, of course, ultimately, the world then does have to turn against them. Russia's drive to eliminate the Ukrainian people continues. And it is no secret that Russian forces commit war crimes on a daily basis. The longer the war in Ukraine goes on, the more it's going to get like Chechnya, the more cities in Ukraine are going to look like Aleppo in Syria, i.e. no longer existent. I mean, this is the thing, no one really knows why now, as in he could have done it at any time in the last eight years. Uh, you know, the invasion of, of, of Crimea and, and Donbass in 2014. I mean, this is the thing, that the conflict has been going on in Ukraine for years now. As to why he's done it now, I mean, he did it obviously in the winter because it's technically easier to go over frozen ground than it would be in the summer, although not that you necessarily know it by the, by the losses the Russian army have taken. There's lots of speculation about the state of his health, about his own personal reasons for doing it. Again, no one really knows, and it's very tempting for people to look at pictures of his puffy face and go, oh, he must be, you know, have terminal cancer or whatever. Who knows? It's, you know, it, it's tempting to think of him as this, you know, this, this sort of mix of Howard Hughes and Hitler in downfall, sort of pacing vast Black Sea mansions, isolated, paranoid about COVID. I think it's, it's, it's all of a piece with, with his world view. Putin defines a success, strength, anything that's revealed him to be strong, anything that's made his opponent look weak. So, you know, when he goes into these other countries and they do nothing, like going to Crimea in 2014 and stealing that off Ukraine, that was a huge success. You know, he, he, he's a gambler, he's reckless. He's like a person who drives through a red light at 100 miles an hour, and if he hasn't had a crash, he says that's been a successful manoeuvre. Well, you know, most people regard that as not a particularly successful thing to have done. You know, you've always killed yourself and other people doing it, but, you know, that's fine by it. Evidence suggests that the Wagner Group has been used as a proxy by the Russian government, allowing it to hide the true casualties of Russia's foreign interventions and deny any wrongdoings.
Prigozhin initially denied any links to the Wagner Group, even suing journalists for linking his name to the private military company. However, a few months into the Russo-Ukrainian war, Prigozhin finally claimed to have founded the group and described the battalion as patriots. The Wagner Group has since become one of the world's most feared mercenary companies. Many of the so-called patriots express neo-Nazi and far-right extremist views and even come from criminal backgrounds. The Ministry of Defense used the Wagner Group as the main assault force in the Battle of Bakhmut, the longest and bloodiest battle of the conflict so far. government and the West have accused the Wagner operatives of some of the most violent war crimes, including murder, torture, rape and robbery of civilians. On the 23rd of June 2023, Ukraine watched closely as its Russian neighbors plunged into turmoil. Security is being heightened in Moscow after the leader of a Russian parliamentary group has turned on his country's own defense ministry. The Wagner Group has been one of the most violent Russian forces fighting in Ukraine, but now its leader is accused of mutiny. For months, Prigozhin had been lambasting Russia's high command for mishandling the Ukraine war and repeatedly accused the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, of incompetence. Shoigu! Gerasimov! Where are your s***s? Look at them, s***s! S***s! Earlier in June, the Kremlin demanded all Russian mercenaries sign contracts with the defense ministry, a move seen as an attempt to control Wagner. But Prigozhin remained defiant. He refused to comply and voiced increasingly vitriolic tirades against the Russian military hierarchy. The Wagner chief had no choice but to lead a march for justice against Russia's leaders. угроза для нашей государственности, для нас, как нации. Это удар по России, по нашему народу. И наши действия по защите Отечества от такой угрозы будут жесткими. The Russian government and media corporations appealed to Wagner fighters to abandon their leader, describing the march as a criminal adventure.
However, by the 24th of June, Prigozhin's 25,000-strong force had crossed the Russian border and captured the city of Rostov-on-Don without firing a single shot. This is the first direct serious challenge to Putin's authority in 24 years of being president. First of all, Vygotian is no knight in shining armor. He is a thug, to put it lightly, um, and frankly, a killer. The governor of the region ordered residents to remain calm and stay indoors as Wagner forces took control of army headquarters. But the locals did otherwise. Many headed out onto the streets in support of the rebellion. In that moment, the Wagner group were regarded as heroes. In the biggest threat to Putin's presidency yet, Wagner troops began to march on Moscow. The Ministry of Defense heightened security on the streets and military helicopters opened fire on rebel mercenaries already more than halfway to the capital. Yevgeny Prigozhin soon became Russia's most wanted man, and the world watched on as Putin raged from inside the Kremlin. A Russian private army leader called for an armed rebellion against the Kremlin, but he is now telling the troops to stand down. Vladimir Putin does not give in easily. He is known for having a tight grip on his country and his people. There is one element dictators fear more than anything else, and that is the people they rule over. The ultimate way to get rid of a dictator is to have a revolution from the grassroots, from the streets, from the fields, from the factories, a revolution to actually topple a dictator. It is so hard for a dictator to stay in power if everybody in that country wants to get rid of him. If you've got rulers that you don't like and you can't get rid of them through elections, then your, your only alternative is mass protest, you know, revolution. But it's very difficult to start a revolution in a police state. It's far too risky, it's far too personally dangerous. It's not just personally dangerous, it's, it's if, you, if, you, if you're a political opposition in a police state, that's a danger to everyone you know, it's a danger to your friends, it's a danger to your family. The world's most notorious dictator slipped out of the trap once again, employing Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko to negotiate with the Wagner chief and offer security guarantees. By late afternoon of the 24th of June, Prigozhin ordered his men to stand down, stating that he wanted to avoid bloodshed a move which angered the Ukrainian government and disillusioned the rest of the world.
it's like a turf war among mafia bosses. Of course, one of the key issues in any kind of mafia situation is to keep the peace. You don't want anybody to rock the boat. And that was Prigozhin's mistake now, he rocked the boat. And that got the whole thing unsettled. And this is where we are now, and this is where uh, the situation at the moment, while we are sitting here, while the news are going, going on somewhere else, is actually very volatile. Because we don't know whose loyalty falls where. Putin's chef had abandoned the fight. But would he slip into the shadows quietly? The dust settled on the rebellion. The Kremlin announced that Prigozhin would be extradited to Belarus with the word of Putin that he would not face charges for treason. However, after Prigozhin left Rostov-on-Don, many people could not track his whereabouts. His location became unknown. Prigozhin's patriots returned to base. The Kremlin forced the mercenaries to sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense, finally absorbing the troops into the Russian military. The Wagner Group's power had well and truly been stamped out. In the following weeks, the former Wagner chief's whereabouts remained murky. People reported sightings of Prigozhin in St. Petersburg, Belarus, and even at a Russia-Africa summit hosted by President Putin. However, if there's one thing Putin hates, it's betrayal. He keeps his inner circle tight and creates an atmosphere of fear to ensure his followers stay loyal. Rumors swirled worldwide that the Russian president had ordered Prigozhin's execution, a fate which many traitors have faced before. There's no doubt that it's very hard to protest anymore you know, on the streets of any Russian town or city. Um, you know, the police are very heavy-handed. You know, we see even elderly people being you know, forcibly detained, bundled into the backs of vans. We get people being beaten up. Of course, you know, political opponents and those who have been against uh, 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 Putin have, have had been murdered or had attempts against them. You look at Navalny, one of the most sort of celebrated opponents of Putin, you know, poisoned, almost killed. So yeah, violence is, is a key part of Putin you know, you, you know, wielding political control. Over the last 20 years, a spate of unusual killings have taken place in Russia and the UK. Journalist and Putin critic Anna Politkovskaya was found dead in the elevator of her Moscow apartment block on the 7th of October 2006. Five men were eventually sentenced for the killing, but whispers of the Kremlin's involvement spread far and wide. Again, call upon the Russian government to bring justice to those responsible for ordering, planning, and executing Ms. Politkovskaya's murder. Like many other journalists reporting on the North Caucasus over the past two decades, Ms. Politkovskaya was killed in retaliation for her efforts to uncover corruption, abuse, and violation of human rights. Her death became known as the murder that killed the free press in Putin's Russia. Two months later, the former FSB officer and Russian defector, Alex Litvinenko, suddenly fell ill. Litvinenko had been poisoned with polonium-210 whilst meeting two former agents, Dmitry Kovtun and Andrei Lugovoy, in Mayfair, London. The poisoning of 
Alexander Litvinenko, a former KGB agent in London. Litvinenko has poison put in his tea, dies of radiation poisoning. Uh, absolutely inconceivable that that wasn't done without the direct orders of, uh, of Putin. The conclusion that the Russian state was probably involved in the murder of Mr Litvinenko is deeply disturbing. It goes without saying that this was a blatant and unacceptable breach of the most fundamental tenets of international law and of civilised behaviour. Exactly a year after she lost her husband in agonising circumstances, Marina Litvinenko joined supporters for a symbolic reading out of the statement Alexander Litvinenko produced from his deathbed. You may succeed in silencing one man, but the howl of protest from around the world will reverberate Mr. Putin in your ears to the rest of your life. Пиздец, это беспилотник. Сбили, бабахнуло два раза, взорвалось, падает. Ты посмотри, падает. Yevgeny Prigozhin has died after a business jet he was on crashed about 100 miles northwest of Moscow. The events of Yevgeny Prigozhin's death made front page news across the world. Seven passengers and three crew were on the private jet flying from Moscow to St. Petersburg, including the Wagner military commander, Dmitry Utkin. Most likely will be presented as a, officially presented as a, uh, a friendly fire incident and uh, so, or, something like, or something like that. It will never be officially confirmed that uh, uh, Prigozhin or his air jet was uh, specifically targeted. Uh, of course not, but uh, we know when, uh, when Putin um, intends to send a message. Tabloids in Britain termed the death as Putin's revenge, and theories on the Wagner chief's demise started to spill out everywhere. The West mainly believes that Putin had Prigozhin and his associates killed. A preliminary US intelligence assessment concluded that an intentional explosion caused the plane crash. I'll say right up front, uh, first of all, our initial assessment is that it's likely uh, Prigozhin was killed. Um, we're continuing to assess uh, the situation. British security sources viewed the death as completely unsurprising and determined that the FSB most likely targeted the Wagner chief's plane. The Kremlin once again denied all involvement in the crash. Russian officials strongly refuted the West's theories about Putin ordering the execution and remained dismissive of criticism. The Wagner Group and its supporters continue to mourn their leader. Memorials have cropped up in cities and towns across Russia. Some believe their chief is still alive and plotting another rebellion. But for many others, Yevgeny Prigozhin has become a martyr. Prigozhin's 24 hours of chaos shook the Kremlin to its core. For a moment, it seemed like a man with no previous military experience could bring down a whole dictatorship, a fact Putin is surely embarrassed about. Putin's Achilles heel is his own ambition. I think he's overreached himself. I think that he is attempting now to do things that actually he doesn't have the manpower or materiel or, or ultimately the support to do it. I think, I think that's his problem. He's been in power for too long, that paranoiac, narcissistic mentality has now completely in control of him. He's no longer got that perspective that he needs. Prigozhin's subsequent death has exposed to the world that corruption and violence are still rife in Russian politics. The tyranny of the Soviet Union still bleeds into the country's foundations. 
we see throughout Putin's uh, presidency, a sort of utter indifference to the value of human life. If it's a choice between human life uh, and his power, he's always consistently chosen his power. The Kremlin has eliminated an immediate threat for now. But before long, there will be others. And with President Putin damaged and licking his wounds, it seems like the prime time to topple his power.